All right, so today we're actually going to go into the realm of V-Ray. And what I've done in this class is I've decided that mixing some V-Ray in with Rhino is always a good strategy because we get to kind of get started with some geometry, then we move into some basics of V-Ray, then we go back and do some more complex geometry, and then we come back and do some more complex V-Ray, and we keep working our way through the system such that by the end of the class, you're really proficient in both, and you've built your skills up from the ground on both of those things. So today we're going to take a break from Rhino even though we're gonna be working in Rhino and we're gonna concentrate on V-Ray. There's always a little bit of Rhino that goes along with it, but I wanna walk you through the, the V-Ray part um, in a little bit more detail. So I'm gonna go ahead and double click on Rhino to get started. I have previously set up the desktop, so I've already logged into my OneDrive, um, so we're good to go. But I went ahead and I didn't open Rhino because I wanna go through the setup process yet again to make sure that you're all following along and getting the same thing uh, that I am. So I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, here, and we're loaded up. I'm going to, as is typical, close all of the V-Ray toolbars, except for the V-Ray all toolbar. And I'm going to dock that V-Ray all toolbar right at the top here above my uh, basic toolbars and below my command line. There it is. I'm going to go ahead and maximize my screen here. And then because we're working in V-Ray, I'm going to actually uh, change the current renderer. So I'll go up to the render menu here and I'll come down to current renderer and I'm gonna change from Rhino render to V-Ray for Rhino. Unfortunately, that's not a default that's set. We have to do it every time. So we'll go ahead and now it's switched over into V-Ray for Rhino as my default toolbar. So once again, that's under render, current renderer, V-Ray for Rhino. So now everything that I do will render out in V-Ray. So before we even get started, I do want to make sure that my units are correct. So right now I look down here in the lower left corner and I see that it's in millimeters. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file. I'll go to file and then new. Don't need to save changes to this one. We're going to do a large object inches template. I'm going to go ahead and say open. There we go. So brand new template. My units are now in inches. I'll go ahead and go file and then save as, and I'm gonna call this one my exercise 204. So let's find today's folder here. And let's call this uh, fall, oops, helps if I can type here, fall 2022. And then we'll go ahead and save, perfect. So now I have a file to start working with, and I'm ready to, um, to save my work. From here, it's really a matter of getting some stuff set up before we get into the, the details of V-Ray. So we need a few things on our, on our drawing plane or in our, v, in our Rhino model to actually show things in V-Ray. So up here at the top of our V-Ray toolbar, we're going to look for something that looks like uh, kind of a rectangle that's in perspective that has an infinity symbol on it. That is the V-Ray infinite plane button. And so if you want to type in the key command, it's viz infinite plane, or excuse me, V-Ray infinite plane. And when I install that, what it's doing is it's installing a really large rectangle on the ground. And we can see it right there. If I switch from, from wireframe into shaded mode, we'll actually see it as a shaded rectangle. So to do that, I'll click the little down facing arrow next to where it says perspective, and I'll choose shaded mode. That'll fill that infinite plane in. And what this infinite plane really is, is it's a symbol that represents a ground that stretches off to infinity. So yes, it looks kind of like an extra large square, but it really represents the ground going off in all directions to the horizon. So that's been installed on our scene. Let's go ahead and look at our layers. And let's create a, right here under layer one, I'm going to double click it and I'll call that layer environment. And then I would like to create a sub layer for environment. So you look over here, we have the new layer button and then right next to it is the new sub layer button. And so that's something that Rhino does that's a little bit different than some of the other programs that are out there is that it allows us to create these sub layers, which is really, really convenient. So I can have a main layer called environment. I can have a sub layer that is for infinite plane. So we'll call it V-Ray. I am 
V-Ray infinite plane. And I could also create a sublayer here beyond the V-Ray infinite plane for light. We'll get to both of those. So the V-Ray infinite plane, I need to take the infinite plane and put it on that layer. So let me go ahead and right click on the layer and say change object layer. And now my V-Ray infinite plane is on the infinite plane layer. What I recommend doing is once you have it on its infinite plane layer, go ahead and click the little padlock that's next to it. And that way you can't accidentally select it as you're working. It just exists, how do you, which is always a good idea. Yes, go ahead. How do you get the square in there again? So the square is this tool right here. It's the V-Ray infinite plane tool. If you look at your V-Ray toolbars, you see all the, the kind of brownish ones. Those are all the lights. Immediately after that is a uh, kind of a square with an infinity symbol on it. That's that V-Ray infinite plane. You just click on it and it'll drop the infinite plane into your scene. And then um, how do you get it to fill? So if you want to get it to fill, it's just the view. So if we look in the perspective view, if I click the down arrow next to the name perspective, I can change my viewport style to be shaded instead of wireframe. So there it is in wireframe. We can change it to be shaded. And now you'll see it as a plane. Good questions. Nice, thank you. No problem. So I have that V-Ray infinite plane. The next piece that I need, and actually I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double click on perspective to make it large here. The next thing that I need to create a quality rendering is I need a basic light. And we're gonna, we're gonna use a very basic light setting in the beginning of this class. We will get to nighttime renderings, we'll get to all different kinds of lights, but for right now we need what's called a basic directional light. So if you look up here at your V-Ray toolbar, we've got all those tan options, those are all the light options. The last one is the directional light tool. We're gonna use that. Unfortunately, when you click on it and you try to create your directional light, this light stays flat to the ground plane. And to me, that's a little bit hard to, yes, you could jump into views and use your side view to, to set it up so that it's pointing at an angle. To me, that's really difficult to set up. So what I do before I click on the V-Ray directional light tool, I create a box. I'm gonna come over here, box, corner to corner. And I'm gonna draw a very basic box. The measurements of it don't matter, but I'm gonna use the diagonal corners, so there and there, to help set up my light because I can snap to those corners. So let's make sure I have my snaps turned on. I'll turn on end snap, mid snap, and I love perpendicular, so I'm gonna turn on perpendicular snap. And now when I create that directional light, I can, it's gonna ask me for the end of the directional light vector, that would be the bottom corner. And then I can use my snaps to create the upper corner. And you see that when I do that, the light is now pointing down on a diagonal at my objects. That's what we're looking for. So let me repeat that again. So I'll start by using the box tool, box corner to corner. I'll draw a box, I'll pull up some height. There it is. And I'll use these two corners to create that directional light. So I'll come up to the directional light tool. I'll pick the lower corner and then I'll pick the upper opposite corner right there. And then my light is actually shining down on an angle, which is what I'm after. I don't need the box anymore, so we can go ahead and delete that box. A couple notes about this directional light that's here. This directional light is independent of scale. So it doesn't matter where it is, it's all directional light that's coming uniformly from one direction. So it's a great light for these early renderings because it doesn't involve any sophistication and there's no special settings for it. So we set it up, we draw that so that it's pointing generally down and we're good to go. I'm gonna change that light. So once again, I've selected it. I'm gonna change it onto this light layer. So I'll right click and I'll say change object layer. It's now on the lights layer and I can confirm that it's on the layer by turning the layer off. Yep, there it is. And once again, just like the V-Ray infinite plane, we'll go ahead and lock that so that we can't accidentally move it. So these two steps, the infinite plane and the basic directional light 
are key components to getting ready to, to do some rendering. So we need a light source and we need a ground. And so we've gotten both of those things. If you look back, this is ancient history. If you look back at that first exercise 201 file, you'll see that there is in fact an infinite plane and there is in fact a directional light that I put in there for you to get ready. But for our purposes, it's much easier to just create them right now. So let's take a minute and let's go over V-Ray. So to access V-Ray, we've, we've done a little bit with our V-Ray toolbar so far, but the big piece of this is the V-Ray asset editor. It's the first button in the V-Ray toolbar. If you click on that, it brings up this V-Ray asset editor. You could type in V-Ray show asset editor. To me, that's a lot to type. So I just click the button. And this asset editor is essentially everything all in one. And in the old versions of V-Ray, they used to separate out. You had light controls as a separate dialog. You had settings as a separate dialog. You had materials as a separate dialog. Now they, they wrap it all into one dialog box and it's a lot to digest. So we're gonna go through some of the basic settings right now, just so that you're kind of familiar with it. The good news is they fine tuned the settings and the default settings are generally reasonable. So let's take a look in, in more depth at this V-Ray asset editor. So right here in, the, in this window, we have our basics and it's kind of the center window. Notice that on each side, there's a little arrow to the side. Those refer to drawers that push out to the side. So we can get information on the left side. We can get other information on the right side. So when this whole window is expanded, there's a lot of information kind of delivered to you in these different panes. I'm gonna minimize those for the moment and we'll talk through some things. Across the top of this asset editor are some key pieces. The first one right here with the checkerboard pattern, that is the materials. So when we get into materials, we're gonna be working with that little tab here. Next over is the light settings right here. This gives us information about lighting. Right now we have a basic directional light and we have what's called the Rhino document sun. We'll ignore the Rhino document sun for the most part. Our directional light is what, what is providing our um, light in this particular scene. The next thing over is called geometry. These are special V-Ray objects that are in the scene. Notice that we have an infinite plane that's been installed. Next option over are what are called render elements. We'll explain these and explore these in far more detail toward the end of the class. For right now, they don't matter. Next little section over here is our textures information. We'll get to the textures in a little bit more detail, but I like to kind of point this stuff out. Then we move into the gear icon. These are our V-Ray settings. So when I click on that gear icon, we get to see information that are our basic settings. So right here under render, we can see what it's using. It's using the CPU to do the rendering. It is not an interactive rendering. That's how we want it. It is a progressive rendering. So it's gonna get progressively better as it continues to render. And we have the ability to set a quality to the rendering. So right now our quality is set at medium, which is fine for our purposes today. Later on in the semester, you're gonna be bumping this up into high or high plus, but we'll stick with medium for right now. Remember that render quality is always an equation of time. Do I have enough time to render in higher quality? Then you can do it. Okay, so we'll come down here. That was the render drawer. Next thing here, we'll expand camera. So just like, actually, I'll close the render settings and just show the camera to try to keep this clean. So the camera setting right here has to do with how the, uh, like as if you were exposing a scene. So if you imagine going out to a real world, you have to take your camera out and you have to actually take a picture of something. Well, it has the ability to set an exposure value. So this number controls how light or dark the scene is. So the higher this number, right? The darker the scene is going to be, the lower this number, the lighter the scene is going to be. By default, 10 is probably a bit bright. So I would bump it up to maybe 12 and we'll see what happens. White balance, if we needed to set it, we could set it. Depth of field and effects, we're not going to worry about right now. So we'll close the camera settings and open the render output settings. So you can see that there are settings upon settings upon settings in here. 
Okay, so the render output settings allow us to determine the width and height of the image that we're going to render and or the aspect ratio. I generally love to pick match viewport because when we do that, what you see rendering is what you're going to get. So that's the width and aspect of my particular viewport. So exactly what I see in this window behind me is what's going to render out. Our image width and height right now, as long as it's below 1,000, we're fine. It's not going to take too long to do the rendering. Long term, we're going to bump that number way up to get higher quality renders. There is an ability to automatically save the image when it's done rendering. So you could turn that on and tell it where you want it to save. Again, for our purposes today, we're not going to worry about it too much, but I like to point that out. We're not going to do any animations, so we'll leave that one turned off for right now. The environment settings, this has to do with what's happening in the background of a particular image. Right now, the default settings are just fine. We're not going to worry about the environment, but we will get in here into customizing the environment a little bit later on in the semester. Material override, this is something that's used sometimes when your rendering is not turning out. You can actually override all the materials with another material and kind of do a test render that way. So sometimes that's useful. Again, we're going to leave it off for today. And the last object down here is called the V-Ray Swarm. This is going to allow you to use other computers on the network to increase the speed of your rendering. Again, we'll leave that off for today's purposes. Now, I should point out, let me go back to render, that these are the basic options that are within render. However, if we click on the little arrow to the side, you'll see that render also has a bunch of other render parameters. And this is where I'm telling you that there's more and more detail that's inside of V-Ray. It's a very sophisticated program. So we could actually go in and start to make some specific settings to our render parameters. We can set a noise, noise limit threshold. We can get into a lot of these special options. We're not going to worry about the special options today, but I like to point out that they exist. Same thing happens on any one of these when we start to go in there. We might get different options on the right side. So you're always looking for those options. After our settings, which are basically set correctly now, we can move over into actually rendering. That's this teapot icon. If I were to click on this teapot icon, nothing's going to happen right now because I don't have any objects in my scene. I'll go ahead and do it. It will open what's called a V-Ray frame buffer, which is this window here, which will show us what's happening in the render. So like I said, I don't have anything. I just have an infinite plane on the ground that's white, so the whole image is white. This V-Ray frame buffer is the window in which the rendering is complete. We can, if we accidentally close that window and we wanted to open it again, this last tool here is to open that V-Ray frame buffer again. So once again, I'll go ahead and close that for right now. And we'll revisit some of these options a little bit later, specifically the camera settings, because we may need to make some adjustments to that. Uh, this number may go up to about 14, we'll see. Okay. So now that we've done that, we need a basic composition of five objects to play around with today. And so what I'm asking you to do by a basic composition is I just mean create some objects. So I might come in here and I might create kind of a taller rectangle like that. And then I might come in and create a sphere. So I use the box tool, let's use a cylinder next. And let's create a cylinder. Let's come over here and let's see what else we can create. Let's do a sphere. Now the sphere is going to be half sunken. So we probably need to move this one up. You can use the transform move command to do this, but I need to move it vertically, not, so if I were to just move it right now, it would just stay in that ground plane. So I need to move it vertically. So I'll go to move and I'll click on vertical or type V for vertical, and then I can move it up and it's ground plane. It actually doesn't have to be fully above, but I wanted it to be a little bit. We can have these objects collide with one another. So I can move this over so it's colliding with that shape a little bit. We could also have it independent of the other objects like that. Okay, so let's see what other shapes could we create? Sure, why not? Let's do a pyramid. We'll do a pyramid over here. There's a pyramid and, uh, oh, I don't know. Let's do, sure. Okay, 
So I've created this composition of objects. Again, the composition of objects doesn't really matter. You're going to be creating five objects. We could put each of these objects on a separate layer and control the materials by layer. We could also control the materials individually. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to put all of these objects onto, uh, actually they're currently on the default layer. So that's fine, we'll leave them on the default layer, but let me rename it to be objects. Perfect. And so with this objects layer, if I go into my V-Ray asset editor, I'm going to look at my materials. So I want to create a material. We'll get to loading materials a little bit later in the lecture, but we're going to start by just creating a basic material. I'm going to click on the material icon here, and I'm going to choose generic. That's the most basic kind of material. I'll choose the generic. And there it is. The generic material is just this gray color. So I could take this generic material, and I could apply it to all the objects that are on the objects layer. And I can do that by just right-clicking on the material and saying, apply it to layer objects. So now all of those objects, which are on this objects layer, when I go to render, will have this gray material on it. So let's do a test render. I'll click the little teapot icon. And we can see my objects. We can certainly see the shadows, but the color is not really showing up yet. So that probably means I need to change my exposure value just a bit. So let me stop the render. We'll close the frame buffer. We'll go back to my settings. And I'm going to change this exposure value. Let's go up to 14 and see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and click the render icon again. And there we go. Now at 14 exposure value, we're seeing the gray material. So let's say that I don't want the gray material anymore. I want to override that material with a different color. So let's come back to my materials. There is my generic material. Let's change the color. So I'll look over here at my material properties. And I'm going to change the color of the material properties to be something other than gray. So I'll click on that gray box and let's make this red. And you see that my preview shows as red now. For clarity purposes, I'm going to rename generic to be red. There it is. And this is still applied to the objects layer. Even though I changed the material name, it's still going to be applied. So when I go back and render again, those objects have now changed to being red objects. So that's how we go about applying materials. Now, all of the objects on this layer, let me close the material asset here, all of these objects have that, that layer applied to them. If I say, you know what, I really want this sphere to be a completely different color, I want it to be blue, I can move it onto a different layer, but I don't have to. I can go ahead and I can add a new material. So let's come up here to my materials list. I'm going to choose, I right click to choose a new one. I'll choose generic. There it is. There's my gray material. Let me double click and let's call this one blue. And I'll change my material color, the diffuse color, to be blue. Let's come down here to blue. Let's pick a blue. There it is. Now it's blue. So right now, if I were to render, all of these objects are red because the layer is saying that the red material is on them. If I wanted this object to be blue, I can simply select it and then right click on blue and say apply to selection. So previously I said apply to layer. Now I'm just going to apply to selection. So when you apply a material directly to an object, that overrides the default material that's on the layer. So if I were to render right now, that object is going to be blue because I've applied the material directly to that object. So let's make a few more materials. Let's right click on the materials. Let's choose a new generic material here. Let's change this one to be, I don't know, green. And then I'm going to change the color to be green. I'm going to pick a darker green here, say like that. And I want green to be applied to, oh, I don't know, this piece. So I'll right click and I'll say apply to selection. And now that object is green. I'll do the same thing with a couple more materials. 
let's do a new generic material and let's pick a different color. Let's do a, a kind of a pinkish purple, maybe like that. And we'll call this one pink. And so let's apply the pink to this pyramid. Oops, sorry. Right click on pink, say apply to selection. Now, there's a good question. Some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, I've applied these materials to these objects and they're not showing up as colors anymore. And that's because we're still just in shaded mode. It's showing us just the objects. If we wanna see a preview of these, we can actually go click this down arrow next to perspective. And we can say, let me see a rendered preview of what this looks like. And there we're seeing a rendered preview. We see my red objects, we see my blue objects, we see my green objects, my pink objects, etc. This rendered preview is not necessarily accurate. So it's an approximation. So it's not as good as the final rendering. So it's important to keep that in mind. So I'll leave this on the rendered preview mode. So once again, that's up by the perspective, the name of the viewport. I'll click the down arrow and choose rendered. Looks like I have a question. Go ahead. Should I uh, always in every file do a, I need to create a, the color from scratch or there is a way to save them uh, in my file. So if I'm choosing a special green, I can use it in other projects. You absolutely can save your materials to use in a different file. So we haven't gotten there yet. Today, we're starting with just creating basics. Then I'll talk about loading in new materials. We'll get to that. Um, but I will talk eventually about saving materials. It's actually as simple as selecting the material and then clicking this little save disk icon. And you can save the material for loading in later. Thank you. OK, so let's create one more. I'll come up here. I'll right click and I'll say another generic material. Uh, we'll call this one orange. And then let's pick an orange. Maybe like that. And then I'm going to right click, or excuse me, I'm going to select this object. I'm going to right click and say apply to selection. And now all of my objects have a color applied. I've created those five materials. Let me go ahead and do a full render. I'll click on the teapot icon and we'll take a look at what this looks like. So you can see down at the bottom that it says rendering image and it says pass and it keeps increasing the number. That's finer and finer details of the rendering. So here we are with our rendering. We can see all our materials applied. We can see nice shadows being cast onto one object, et cetera. Let's go ahead and save this image. There's a little disk icon at the top of the V-Ray frame buffer. It says save current channel. That's what I wanna do. I'm gonna click on it to save the current channel and I'll put it on my OneDrive into a folder for today. So let me go into my folder. I'm gonna create a new folder for the fall of 2022. And in that, I'm gonna say this is exercise 204 uh, and we'll call it 01 because it's the first render I did. Now, I'd like to point one other thing out and that is that the save as type here by default is the portable networks graphics, the PNG. If you save your files as a PNG, which is fine, it will not preserve whatever the background is. For right now, the background's white, so it really doesn't matter. But for the most part, it's better to get in the habit of saving it as a JPEG instead of a PNG. So I'm going to choose JPEG. There's my exercise 204-01. And I'll go ahead and click Save. And so that's my first setting with kind of my basic materials on it. So let's start modifying some materials. Are so the good news is- to, Oh, sorry. Go, no, Are go you ahead. Able to change the camera angle of how, how you're taking the picture? So yeah, all, so if I wanted to change the camera angle, all I have to do is orbit the view and then re-render. So whatever I see on the screen is what I'm rendering. Okay, gotcha. And there's a way to save the view so you can go back and re-render it. It's, a, it's a beyond what we need to do today, but I'll show you that a little bit later on of how we preserve the same view so you can re-render the same thing as you improve. And that's very common in rendering. You set up your view and then you tweak it and you keep making changes and you keep trying the renders and say, oh, this looks better, this looks better. And then eventually you get a high quality render. So let's look at, I'm gonna start with the blue object here. Now the blue object right now is a generic object 
or excuse me, a generic material, it doesn't really have any shine to it. It has no reflection to it or anything like that. So we can change that, however. So if we look at our material properties, again, when I've selected the material, it's the drawer that opens to the right here. And when I do that, we've got the color under diffuse, but immediately below that, we have something called reflection. So if I come over here into reflection, I can choose uh, to turn on essentially reflection for it. Uh, I can do that just using this little slider. So if I increase the slider under reflection color, you'll see that I'll get a little bit of a reflection. And depending on how far I make this slider, the object will appear shinier or less shiny. So there's just a little bit of reflection, maybe like a matte plastic, all the way up to a really shiny piece of plastic. So I want you to go ahead and turn on reflection for one of your objects. So there it is in blue. Let's turn on green. And let's bump that up a little bit so it has some reflection. And I don't know, why not? Let's do it to orange too. Notice that there are other properties about this. We have a reflection glossiness value. So this is kind of how shiny it appears. So let's see if I pull this all the way up so it's nice and shiny there, then I want you to watch this glossiness as I drop it down. So it's super shiny and then it's reflecting, but see how it feels like it's a little bit more matte in its finish. It's not a shiny finish anymore. So that glossiness can control the fact that it is reflecting, but how much of that reflection is actually happening. So I have two very shiny objects. This one is reflecting, but it's a little bit blurry. And let's go ahead and let's render this and see what our final view looks like. So we can see that the blue sphere is now very shiny. This um, green object is a little bit more shiny. The, the orange object has some shine to it, but it's kind of a matte finish. So we're adjusting how these materials are applying using those settings. Now that this is done rendering, I'll save this one too. And let's change my format into JPEG. And this is going to be 02. I'll click Save. There it is. Let's continue to, to explore these. So thus far, we've dealt with the color of the object. Then we dealt with the reflection of the object. Now, if you want to play around with some of these other options, you're more than welcome to try the metalness option, for example. This makes it appear a little bit more metal in its tone. So I'm uh, by just because I'm going through certain uh, options here doesn't mean that you can't explore the other little options. But what I want to explain, and let's go back to that blue object here, is I want to look down here and find opacity. The opacity determines how transparent the object is. So right now at a value of one, it's fully solid. But if we start to drop this value down, you'll see that it becomes transparent. If we go all the way close to the bottom here, that's 0 0.03, you can see that it's almost fully transparent. So we really only, we wanna see a little bit of it. So let's change that slider, maybe to right about there. And let's go ahead and take the red object in the back, why not? And let's change the opacity of that object. So we'll drop that one down a little bit, maybe right about like that. So I've adjusted those two transparencies. Let's re-render it. I'll click on the teapot icon again. And you'll see that those two objects are starting to become transparent. You'll also notice that the rendering is taking a lot longer. And that's because we're now calculating with V-Ray how the light passes through the object. We also have a little bit of an error here. The one thing that V-Ray absolutely doesn't like is when two objects are in exactly the same plane. So this cube or square in the background, the bottom of it is in line with the infinite plane. It's causing that weird collision to happen. So let's fix that. I'm going to close my option and I'm just going to move this up slightly. I'll type move followed by V for vertical. And we'll move that up just a little bit. There it is. Now we'll go ahead and render it. And now we don't have that collision anymore. We'll see just the bottom 
as a color. So now we have some materials that are opaque. And with those opaque materials, we can now start to adjust further. So we can control how the light passes through an object by using this refraction. Let me go back to my blue object because that's transparent. Right down here, we can go into refraction. And this refraction will deal with how the light passes through an object. So one of the things that's important about refraction is this IOR value. So this IOR value is known for many materials. So you can actually look up, so if I did a Google search here, I could look up IOR value and I can get an index of refraction value of various objects. Uh, let's see, materials, oh, sorry, that's in the wrong, let's see. Ah, here it is. IOR values for common materials. So we'll come down here. Here's an example. So we have a light that's shining through an object. This is how it passes through the object and exits, exits at the other side. So where this matters is when, here we get down here, come on, give me the full value. All right, we can look at a particular material and we can find out what the IOR value is. So for example, the IOR of a diamond is 2.418. So we can come back into V-Ray here and we could change this IOR value to 2.418. And now the index of refraction on this is going to be like a blue diamond because I happen to have the color as set as blue. But any one of these, you can go back and look at, right? So water, 1.325, titanium, 2.160, mercury, 1.620, you know, Pyrex glass, 1.474. So you can use these kinds of tables to more accurately create materials on your behalf. So I've set up that one with refraction in it. I'm gonna go ahead and render that one out. And you might not see that much difference in here, but it is a subtly different. And maybe we need to make that a little bit darker. Let's come back up to our opacity. Make that a little bit more solid here. I'm gonna stop and then re-render it. And let's see if the end results, oh, not, not a little too opaque. All right, let's stop and let's render again. And again, this is to get you familiar with these tools. I want you to know where these options are. And to the extent you wanna play around with things, don't hesitate. You can actually on a transparent object, let me go into red here. We can pretend that there's uh, some, some color to the inside. So I can come down here uh, into, oh, let's see, where is it? Under refraction right there. Um, let's go back up, we'll go to 2.0. And I can actually add a fog color to the inside. So I could say, let's fog it with a particular color. And we might need to drop that multiplier down like that. And let's go ahead and render it and see. Nope, too much, too much. So I may need a, a lighter fog color. Let's do it something like that. No, it's turning out too dark. Uh, so I'll have to play around with the, flaw, the fog here to get the right options. Anyway, um, those are all sliders and options that you can play around with. Once we're done, you can go ahead and do one final rendering. I'm gonna stop. I'll start the rendering one more time. And here's my final rendering of these shapes. So we could spend a lot of time and actually create a particular shape we can control how you know what the metal looks like we can control what the transparency looks like etc but there are a lot of materials that have already been made for us and sometimes we want to just apply ready-made materials let me go ahead and click the save icon here i'm going to save the current channel again this is going in my folder as a jpeg we'll save it as number three and i'll click save 
So now let's explore applying ready-made materials instead of creating our own. So we have all these of our own, but if we open the drawer to our left, you're gonna see a bunch of materials that are already included in V-Ray. So we have things like bricks, we have things like car paint, we have ceramic and porcelain, we have concrete, right? Well, stay away from the emissives right now. We have foams, we have ground like grass, you know, paper. So we've got all kinds of options here. Now, there is another piece to materials and that is how the material, the scale of the material as it's applied to an object. So some of these may not look good when we apply them, but we're gonna give it a shot and see. Let me come back to bricks here and I'm gonna apply some red bricks, this one, to this object here. So I'll right click and say, apply to selection. And it now should have the red bricks on this object. There it is. Now, like I said, the scale might not be that great, but we're gonna go with it. We'll get to that, the whole idea of texture mapping a little bit later in the class. So let's pick some other ones. Let's go to ceramic and porcelain and let's make, make this, this kind of bluish porcelain. Let's apply to the selection. And there it is. Looks like it has some kind of texture on it. That's interesting. Uh, maybe I'll come down here into leather and I'll say, you know what? This pyramid in the black is going to be a black leather and we'll apply to the selection. So when you're going through and doing this, I want you to just play around with some of these objects. Like I said, sometimes the previews don't work. So we'll see if the final rendering works on that particular material. It could be something wrong with the material too. So let's see, let's go into, uh, let's go to- When are you doing that? Is it saving the parameters that you uh, applied before, like the transparency and, uh, and stuff? No, so those, the, the transparency is tied to the materials that I created with that name. So I'm, I'm replacing the, the blue, material so that I created. When you put a new, okay, when you put a new- And I'm putting uh, a new material on the object instead. It's not attached to the object, okay. The new material is now replacing the old material for the object. Okay, thanks. So let's take this this one here and let's put uh, I don't know. Let's do a let's put it in gold. Why not? Let's apply to the selection. Now that'll be gold. And my last object was this blue one. Um, I'd stay away from liquid and glass right now. They're not going to turn out quite right. Uh, we'll get to why in a little bit. Let's make uh, let's make this one out of car paint. Sure, why not? Uh, let's do it out of that reddish car paint. Okay, so now I've applied those materials. Let's go ahead and render again. And you'll see that all those materials that I created have now been applied. Right? We've got our car paint, we've got our gold, we've got our ceramic, got our leather, and we've got our brick. I'm going to go ahead and save this as an option now. And again, I don't care which objects you try. Play around with the materials. That's, it's meant to be fun. So let's change this into JPEG. And this is number four. And then we'll go ahead and click on save. At this point, we're done in our scene, this one that we've created. So you've, you've worked through that. The last piece that I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to save this and then open up our file from last class. So I'll go to file and then open. I'm gonna jump back into our 203 and I'll open up, uh, where did I save it? Fall of 2022. There it is. And now we can apply a material to these objects. So we'll go ahead and open up our V-Ray Asset Editor. I'm gonna do it out of concrete. So I'll go to concrete. Let me apply the, let's do concrete simple. I'm gonna to apply to selection. Now it's applied on that object. I'll right click on it again and apply to selection. And so now I have concrete, but this one can't render yet because it has no background. So if I were to render it, I have no lights and I have no infinite plane on the ground. So I need to fix those two problems. So once again, we'll come back on layer six here. I'll call this environment. I'll create a sub layer for infinite plane. 
I generally abbreviate it as IP. And I'll create a sublayer, again, using the sublayer button for lights. So I'm getting myself organized. My infinite plane needs to go on the infinite plane layer. So let's come up here and choose the V-Ray infinite plane tool. There it is. Let's take it and make sure it shows up on the infinite plane layer. So I'll change object layer after I've selected it. And then I'll go ahead and lock it. And then I also need that light, my basic directional light. So I'll do that the same way. I'll create a box. I'll say like that. I'll use my basic directional light to go from the bottom corner to the top corner. So it's shining down on a diagonal. Then I'll delete my box. I'll select my directional light and I'll put it on the lights layer, change object layer. And then I can go ahead and lock it as well. So now I have that. So now when I go to render it, let me click the teapot again. We have a ground. We can see that concrete's been applied to our object. Looks like it's rendering out a little bit bright. So that would be where my V-Ray options would come in. Let's go back to the asset editor. Let's go into camera. So I'll go to settings and then camera. We're gonna change the exposure value here. Let's go 14.5 eh, and then we'll render again. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. So this last piece is kind of a test to make sure that you could apply it again to another file. Okay, so I can go ahead and save that one. I'll click the little save disk icon, save the current channel. And we'll save it in here as a JPEG once again. And this was number five. And I'll go ahead and click on save. Perfect. So that's what's on the ticket today. That's what we're trying to do. We're, we're playing around with V-Ray. Uh, I'll mention a couple other things, though they're not quite relevant yet. Uh, and that is that you can, of course, save any one of your materials. And you can do that. Uh, actually, I should go back to my previous one because that's where I had my materials in. So let's go back to this one. I'm sure, we'll go ahead and save it. Okay, so let's say that I really liked that, uh, I don't know, uh, my blue material. Okay, I can select it like it is right now. And then I can click this little disk icon that says save asset to file. It's gonna ask me where I wanna save it. And I actually personally keep a resources folder with V-Ray and then I have V-Ray materials and I have a whole bunch of V-Ray materials that I've created or used in the past and I can save those in here. So at that point, it's going to save as type the V-Ray material file, the VR mat. That then allows me to reload it. So let's save it in here. There you go, I've done it. Now, if I happen to delete this material, let's say I didn't, didn't want it anymore, let's get rid of it. I can bring it back by going here to this little folder that says import asset file. And I can go back to my folder here. There it is, blue.vrmat. And I can click open and there it is again. So that's the saving. The advantage also is that if you found a material online, you could open that material. If you downloaded it, you could click on open and you could find another material. So let me go into wood here. This fur is one that I created. So I can actually click on it. I can say open and I can open that fur material. Now there's a few problems on that particular case because it's looking for a file and it's not finding that file. So I'd have to fix it. There's a little uh, information dot here that's telling me I'm missing a file. So we'll get to that a little bit later on in the class if you're, you're struggling to have all these things tie together. But I like to point out that you can save a particular material and you can reload it. Those are important pieces of V-Ray. For right now though, we're creating materials from scratch and we're using the default materials. There's an incredibly large number of materials that are ready made for you to use. And you can use any one of those. You'll also see that if you pick a particular material, let's say I like this plastic orange, I can then edit the properties of that particular material. So I can come in here and I can say, you know what? I wanted to change the diffuse color. I didn't like that orange. I wanna change that to blue. 
right? And I, I can pick blue and now it's gonna have a different color to it. This one's kind of complex because it has two, it has a subsurface layer and an, and an external layer. So I'd actually have to change this twice for it to look right. It just has to do with how that material is created. So the point is that you can always edit a material as well. Okay, so I'm a little bit early today, which is fine. Um, you guys have gone through basically what I need for you. If we come back to our exercise 204, this walks you through everything that I've done, right? And then down here at the bottom, uh, I talk about other importing materials if you wanted to do. Uh, there's, you're opening your exercise 203, et cetera. At the end, I need you to turn something in to prove that you worked on this. Ideally, I think it would be one of your renderings from um, with the five objects in it. So I would go in and if you updated maybe your last, like this one or this one, and you posted that, that'll work. I just need proof that you worked on it, okay? So these are the images that we're trying to create over the course of the day. You'll turn that in as part of your exercise 204. Those of you that have already turned in other um, exercises should have seen them. I went through and was grading this morning. So I got a lot of those checked off. Oh, looks like I'm, I'm out of my licenses. Well, you don't have to see it right now anyway. Um, but uh, you should have seen Exercise 201, exercise 202 checked off. If you turned in exercise 203 already, that was checked off as well. Um, so you can see that we're kind of getting into the flow of things. All right. So at this point, I'm going to stop my share. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, 